champions of democracy with us uh, here this morning. President and Chancellor of Syracuse University, Nancy Cantor, and uh, Chief Oren Lyons. Now, Chief Oren Lyons is the faith keeper. We need to keep the faith, people. He is the faith keeper of the Turtle Clan, of the Onondaga Council of Chiefs, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So uh, let's welcome uh, Chief Lyons and Chancellor Cantor, and we're going to get this conversation going. Chancellor Cantor was a co-founder of Imagining America. Now that happened in 1999 at the White House Millennial Conference on the public democratic purposes of higher education. So we were founded in the big house and uh, here we are today. So uh, I wanna just begin the conversation um, by talking to both Chief Lyons and Chancellor Cantor about their optimism that they share for the future, and particularly for this place of Syracuse and Onondaga uh, County and you know, the entire region. So uh, Chancellor Cantor, uh, optimism for this future is, is well known by, I think, many of us. It's certainly known by the people uh, here, because she's been so active. And because our focus at Imagining America is arts, humanities, and design, and um, we have a loyalist in Chancellor Cantor, I want to ask her uh, maybe to begin by just telling us some about how uh, you feel the arts, humanities, and design are important in bringing community and people together. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is, is push back, right? Okay, As you please. know I would. And namely, I think Orin should go first. Okay. Because this is the first name. This is. <laughs> and I was uh, definitely going to say that it is um, on his, uh, the first people's land that we meet today. So, yeah. Chief Hatt. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nancy. Um, some years back, when we were having a discussion with the, um, with the powers that be in, in New York State on education, uh, they asked us, 
and we had a we had a delegation from uh, from the Six Nation at that time. We were in Albany quite a few years back. I would say maybe 20 years or so, or even more. At any rate, they said, well, they asked us about our ideas about education, and we said, well, we we think that you're you're uh, emphasizing. There's probably better things to emphasize than you do than uh, get to the three R's. And they said, well, what is that? We said, art. If, if we had our druthers, when we were our first thing would be art, and the second thing would be sports, and, and would be the development of the uh, young people. Then we get to reading and writing and arithmetic. And and we felt, and we know, that um, if you ask any kindergarten, any group of kids that age, who's an artist, and everyone will raise their hand. <laughs> everyone will raise their hand. Ask them the same question 10 years later. Now, what happened? What happened to them? And that's the three R's, took over and didn't let them develop their, their broader sense of, of, uh, of what art is. If, if you know, it's intrinsic, it's, it's part of life, it's the beauty. And um, we always had a very difficult discussion when it came to art because um, it categorizes. You know, you hang it on a wall or you can put it over here. And uh, with native people, anywhere you go, you see the design and the art they put in a cradle board, or the clothes they wear, or everything they do is is, is got uh, it's got this intrinsic value of design. It's beyond utility, always beyond utility. <coughs> everything, making a spoon, it's an amazing spoons that are made out of uh, very very beautiful lines. I'll say one more thing. Um, I was in New York City. I worked in New York City for over 10 years in advertising and so forth. So I'm well acquainted with, with, with the American psyche. <laughs> <laughs> they, in many ways. <laughs> and and they, um, they were having a, a, a show at uh, the modern School of, uh, or the uh, Museum of Modern Art, and I was very anxious to see it. And it was juxtaposed. It was uh, modern art juxtaposed with indigenous uh, art. And it was astonishing how much was taken from the indigenous art to be what you call modern art. Medigliani, and then look at the uh, look at the carvings of, of the African art. It's a direct steel. <laughs> so it was astonishing when I went through it. I, I couldn't believe it because it's, a lot of it was direct. I mean, it just transferred over here. <coughs> but it, it was the it was the essence, the abstraction, the ability of the indigenous people to have that that ability to abstract and simplify and, and translate into a, a beauty. And uh, I waited at the other end just to watch people coming out. And they were stunned. I, in their faces, I could see they were stunned mm -hmm. because they had just been uh, educated. <laughs> and it was an amazing, uh, it was an amazing show. And, it's available. I mean, you can. I think you can uh, go back and find that, uh, find those, uh, those books. But it told me something, you know, there that I didn't realize until whoever it was that curated that show really understood what they were doing. So, what it translated to was indigenous people been here a long time, and they have abstracted, you know. What's the favorite design you know you see of an Indian is this, right? That's an abstract for a mountain. It's into its 
fundamental abstract. Her master said that all that design, all abstract ideas. So uh, I just want to put that out there for opinion. So, Chancellor Cantor. <laughs> <laughs> just said. It is that spiritual, environmental, artistic sense of values, of democratic purposes, of ways of coming together as a people. And if this region is going to fulfill itself going forward, it has to return to those roots in lots of different ways and allow the new roots of diversity to really take hold in the region. You know, everything from economic development based within the neighborhoods and the senses of what it means to, to regenerate, all the way to education, as, as Lauren said. And, you know, I just have a feeling that the collaborative spirit the sort of dem democracy making, the kind of action spirit that has allowed the Six Nations to really survive against and thrive against incredible odds over centuries mm -hmm. is what will allow it to go forward here. Don't you think? I, mean, I think um, we've, we've been fortunate uh, Put in Oshoni in uh, our our background and our, our teachers and our our uh, leaders. There were three there were three major periods that we acknowledge. One is the first as how we live and uh, could be translated to religion, our way of life, uh, ceremonies, and so forth. Uh, we don't call it religion; we call it the way of life. And the second major event was uh, the peacemaker, uh, bringing peace to warring nations and, and uh, fierce. You know, I, I looked at, uh, watched Kosovo, and I watched how, how and, and Middle East right now, how fierce it can get. Uh, and, you know, recently the picture of a soldier eating the guts from a fallen enemy. That's going beyond, beyond. And I would urge all of you to understand that when you reach that point, it's almost no return. You better behave and, and you better get your leaders to stop this discussion about war. It's peace. It's peace because that, that's what we we were given in that second uh, uh, coming of the uh, peacemaker, and he made a lot of things. One of the things he said was, never take hope from the people. That was an instruction to the leaders. Never take hope from the people. So um, we're ingrained with that, and, and, uh, and the optimism that you talk about is, is a principle. It's not just optimism, it's a principle. It's a principle of peace. So basing our, our confederacy on, on three elements, peace, equity, and the power of the good minds to be united, that has sustained us over all these, all these times and, and the process of <coughs> leaders. And, and I would take this moment to illustrate that the peacemaker installed the women in a very powerful position in our process of raising leaders. Clan mother has great responsibility. Um, she chooses all the leaders. That's her choice. 
has to be ratified by consensus, by the Klan, by the, by the Council of Chiefs, and finally by the Six Nations, but it is her choice. And I think that was the genius of, of, of that, was that she chose a leader on the basis of what women look at, compassion and, and responsibility. It's a different leader than, than a general. When you put a general in the leadership, then you're going to get a general. And he knows how, you know. He knows what he knows. But if you put a leader who thinks about people, the compassion for, for life, and the responsibility that the peacemaker gave to all of us, which is to protect all life, that's what he said to the leaders. Place in your hands now the protection of all life. A very broad statement that's including grasshoppers and mice and, and birds and trees and grass. All life. That's, that was our responsibility. We do our best, you know. And, and I think the process of, of ceremonies is how we how we install that and so that the people are instructed and uh, and what many Western minds think of as quaint, you know, Indians dancing with feathers. <laughs> that's the principle behind that. And that's to understand nature. Nature's the boss. Nature's always the boss. You will never... When the peacemaker planted the tree of peace, this great white pine, it had four white roots of truth in four directions. And he said, to the leaders and to the people, never challenge this tree representing the spiritual laws of nature. Never challenge those laws because you will not prevail. And that is precisely what we're doing right now around the world. We're challenging every law of nature. I'm telling you, you will not prevail. And since we're part of nature, sayonara. <laughs> we do it ourselves. And so, what's in our hands right now is our own future. That's why it's important to have leaders like, like Nancy who will stand for principle, and who understands uh, the importance of, of, of the spiritual side, the art side, and, and uh, the spirit of uh, responsibility. Yeah, got to be optimistic. I say right now, I mean, uh, I'm in it. This is a big fight, folks. I'm in her. I'm in her. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm for your kids. And, uh, let's get it on, then. <laughs> One of the things, Chancellor Cantor, um, uh, that's so fitting for our conference here, a call to action, is that you have consistently declared and stood on principle, but you've also acted on those principles. Um, and uh, is there something you could share with us just about uh, that is an example of how you've tried to act on, uh, say, the principle that you hold so clearly of connecting the resources of a university with the resources of the community and, and just that role of working together and connecting and uplifting um, both community and university in the process? So, so I think um, already the conversation has gotten to the point where I would want it to be, which is that it's actually about the collective. It's about the community. It's not about you know, universities and, you know, despite the arts and cultural disciplines being about as collective as, as we get, we're not, universities are not used to being a community of experts. And I think the real principle that we've certainly discussed ever since we first knew each other is really comes out of this notion of a collectivity, of a community of experts, not, I think Harry Boyd's sitting here somewhere, at least I know he's in town, and he has that wonderful phrase that you have to transition from the cult of the expert to a in our words, a community of experts. And experts being plural is the key thing. 
So I think the real principle that we've tried to call into action in, in the work in Syracuse has really been about how do you collect around the table enough difference that creativity really gets produced and you get something done? And how do we become humble in that process? Because we're so trained to be so, such experts on everything. I mean, right? I mean, you know, it's almost like that's, that's what education has become, right? It's become, how do you, how do you, like, strain out all the humility, all the, all the, all the sense of doubt, all the, the complexity, all the not knowing something. And at the end of the day, you hand someone a PhD and you give them tenure because they know. <laughs> I just so love being with Lauren because, you know, you would just never let anyone get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe it comes from you and Jim Brown on the lacrosse field. I mean, well, you know. I just learned today that he boxed at Syracuse. I thought I knew everything about him. I couldn't believe this man of total peace was boxing. <laughs> to learn how to duck early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> said the magic word, which is community. Community is, is a huge community. When a, everything is a community, and that's once you understand that, and once you start to work with that, and you find out that you're connected, you know, you're, you're connected with the community, basically. When our, uh, our people know about medicine, they know about the woods, they know everything. And, and so when you're looking for medicine, how do you find it? Because it is something that just doesn't grow everywhere. Uh, so you got to find it. So sometimes you look for a tree because you know next to the tree a certain bush grows, and next to that bush a certain plant grows, and next to that plant is the medicine. It's a community all the way down. So what happens, you know, if, you, if you're uh, the owner of, of, of a lumber company, and you clear cut a section of land, you've destroyed a community. You may plant a, a tree back again, but you've destroyed the community. You've destroyed a, a, a broad section of life that supports one another. And we're all involved in that. We're part of that community. And, and Nancy's perfectly correct. We have to understand, relearn that. Uh, I think the, the genius, again, of, of, our, of our system was uh, our relationship to the earth. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a wolf, that's my family. And so I'm concerned about the wolves, because it's my family. And when the peacemaker gave us our clans at that time, and then if you go to the Navajos or, or the uh, Hopis, and they got a hundred clans. We got eight. They got a hundred. You know, they have a wind clan, they have a cloud clan, they have all this relationship with the earth and they're, they're tied directly to it. Therefore, they're responsible, therefore, they're careful, therefore, the earth is protected. Western society doesn't have that. They don't, you don't have that relationship and you don't understand it, therefore, and therefore you, you challenge it all the time, you're, you're challenging it. Remember what the peacemaker said, you can't win. So everything needs protection because everything works together. It evolves, it changes, and everything's 
So this is human beings' time right now. And how long we're going to be here dependent on your activity, dependent on, on your principles, and dependent on, on whether you can understand community and move back into that section where, where everybody works together and uh, the commons, we call it. When the peacemaker gave us our instruction and the chiefs and the leaders sat there and said, how shall we, how shall we present this to the people so they understand? And they came up with a concept called one dish, one spoon. <laughs> one dish, one spoon. That means everybody shares equally and everybody's taken care of. And then there's an there's a additional statement and that is Nobody owns the woods, but everybody is responsible. One dish, one spoon, nobody owns the woods, but everybody's responsible. You're going to survive on those principles as a species. So, you know, John Mohawk, a, a great thinker, he said one time, just offhand remark, he said, well, as far as I can see, human beings are <laughs> still a biological experiment. <laughs> and there you are. And there you are. There's nothing superior about you except your knowledge of death. You have a foreknowledge of death. Animals don't. They know when it's coming. Elephant goes, knows where he's going. Dog will get ready, find his place. They know when it's coming. But you know when you're this small, it's coming. With that knowledge, it's how you, how you present your life and carry on and protect the future. Seven generations. It's not an empty term. Seven generations means responsibility to the future. Just good advice. So I think the commons that you talk about and Nancy promoted here, which we want to do for Central New York, we want this community to work better, we can do better, We've got good leaders, the women leaders, finally, clan mothers coming up here. <laughs> so the, the, the leaders have, uh, have now presented themselves in central New York, and, and there's an option, an opportunity now to move collectively into a very powerful, um, green, sustainable life. It's right here, and part of that leadership really took flower during, during uh, Nancy's tenure here. Of course, we're all going to be very, very sad to see her leave, but I'll tell you what, Rutgers, they're gaining big time. <laughs> and I can tell you what, too, is things are going to change down there, too. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. And uh, for us, all right, we got we to gotta make a good start to give us a good push. And then now we have to really think about that. We have to work, work together. It's not about me, it's about us. We, not me. Well, thanks. Um, so Chancellor Cantor, since you um, are only leaving here and not leaving the community of this work at all, but do you, it, it, are there a couple of um, particular hopes or a hope or um, a particular uh, role that you um, see imagining America growing into, or you would like to help help it grow into? Well, I, I think one of the things that happened when Julie Ellison and others really came together and formed America was really to put front and center the notion that arts making in the broadest sense of that, and democracy really go hand in hand. And that in the middle there, the, the connective tissue that Warren's talking about is really this notion of interdependence that is so, you know, fundamentally, the cultural disciplines are about articulating that interdependence it's a communicative act, but it's, it's, a, it's a reciprocal act. Right? And that's just totally missing 
in, not totally missing actually, because you go out to the longhouse and it's not missing, but it's certainly missing in the rhetoric in Washington, for example. I mean, that's a dumb thing to say. It's an obvious thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> there is no rhetoric in Washington. <laughs> but, but, but I think it's really, I guess the reason I come to that is that it's just so striking right now how important it is to return, to, for imagining America to return, in my view. It, not that it's strayed from that, but, but to, to really redouble the efforts to say that the arts and humanities and design disciplines, again, broadly defined, can put this country slash world back on the right path to democratic process, to that enshrining of that interdependence, to the kind of reciprocal conversation that is evoked by the best of, of artistic impulses. And, and I don't know how we do that, but I think we do it both by <coughs> practicing those disciplines in that way in a collective way, and by reminding people of how far we have strayed from that. And it's not that other disciplines can't be, I mean, you can have civic science as we know, but we don't usually. Whereas you bring those kindergartners before we smash it out of them, that they're artists, you bring them immediately together and the interdependence and the clash and the conflict and the energy and the conversation happens without instruction. So how, how is it that we manage over time to take that away? Right? And I guess just to put a fine point on that, I love that Imagining America committed itself early on, for example, in the tenure team initiative to, to really thinking about the processes that serve to undermine the kind of engaged citizenship through the arts that we can do. And to really, or to say it more positively, how do we deliberately reward I would love to see a conversation in Imagining America that really says, what is it about education that takes that away from us? How do we, and not just university education, but the entire pathway, if you will. That's really a, a fundamental point, and uh, I think that you know, by example, the best teacher is example. And so leaders lead by example, not by speeches or not by, by what they do, not by what they say. As you know, as uh, anybody <coughs> rearing children understand that the children watch what you do. And they don't much listen to what you say, but they watch what you do. <laughs> And they're very good at that. They never miss anything, you know. <laughs> and and uh, going back to your early age, you can remember how, how quick you were to see something. And so by example then uh, is how you, how you teach. So if you want somebody to clean the streets or something, you bend down and you start picking up paper and first thing you know, somebody's helping you and the next thing you've got 10 people there and the next thing <coughs> the street's all clean. But what, have, what did it take? It takes somebody to bend over and pick up that piece of paper to start, by example. So, Central New York's got a very great opportunity. Um, Nancy did such a great thing for the Hoodie Nershoni when she made the Hoodie Nershoni promise. She showed a, an institution what could happen if they opened the doors to, to people, made available uh, education. 
tuition is no small deal anywhere in this country. And tuition and room and board to the Haudenosaunee people. I remember, I remember when she said, well, she came to the long house, you know, and that was her first, first thing she said. She said, well, I've got two propositions here. One is I want to introduce you to uh, my senior uh, vice president, Mr. Smith, and he's going to be our liaison. Lemon Dog Nation, we said, that's good. And then she said, and then we're going to um, uh, offer tuition, room and board to all Onondagas who, who can pass the exam. And there was silence in the long house. <laughs> and one of the chiefs leaned over and said, did I just hear what she said? <laughs> Somebody said, ask her again. <laughs> and so I, I said, uh, would, you, would you repeat just what she said? And she did. And we, we were stunned. We were stunned by that. But look what has occurred. Look what's occurred now. We got 60, at least 60 there right now. It's going to change the face of, uh, of the Haudenosaunee. And can you imagine? that was offered to all the people everywhere. You know, when you, when you come into this world and, and um, you deal with these large problems, people ask me, well, what is it, what is it that, that vexes you? What, what is your, your problem? And I said, well, how do you instruct seven billion people as to their relationship to the earth? Seven billion. In 1950, that was 2.5 billion. 63 years, we have over doubled the population. Seven billion people, water, <coughs> food, place to live, and soon to be eight and soon to be nine. And we're running out of water right now. So the question and the only answer to that is, work together in community. That is the only answer. And so, listening to the discussions that are going on right now, I just returned from the United Nations in Geneva last week, and I talked to the ambassador uh, of human rights for the Netherlands, and I said, what, you, what do you see? He said, I'm I'm not encouraged, he said. I'm not encouraged by the conduct of, of states. They're just not acting on, on behalf of, of the commons, of the people, ours, not acting on behalf of us. And so the, the people have to speak up. People are always the power. They're always the authority. If you unite yourself in a common cause, this is what's going to happen. So I think Central New York, under the leadership of Nancy, she lit the fire, and here it is. And um, uh, I have a, a friend, you know, I'm struck up a strong relationship, and he's working with uh, small companies. And uh, what she found out was that if you share the profit with your workers, they work harder. If they're, it's a simple thing, <laughs> you know, share. I mean, if there's a, if there's a fundamental statement by, by our, our system, it's share. We've got to teach the people how to share again. And there's a compensation for that that you're not going to get any other way. There's a feeling of goodwill that comes from doing what you should be doing. And there's, that's, that's it, that's your reward. That's your reward doing something good. So I think uh, we got this opportunity in Central New York. Mayor Mayor Miner, a lady, a wonderful lady, and we have uh, Joni Mahoney, another wonderful lady. I have, uh, she's one of the greatest right here from university, and uh, just uh, OCC, another lady. <laughs> We're lucky here. <laughs> so taking advantage of that and. and you know, mothers worry about the future, they worry about the children, they worry about the common things. And I think that's our opportunity here, so we're going to, we're going to,
pick up where, where you're, you're moving on and we're going to keep track of you. <laughs> uh, I know something's going to happen down there. I know that. <laughs> so, so, so the opportunity is here and it's community. It is community and that's what we are. We're a human species. We're not black, we're not white, we're not red. We're a species. We can change blood. You can't get any closer than that. <laughs> you can't get any closer than that. So there we are. We have to look at it that way. And we have to look for the commons and the common good in the future. And by example, by example, we'll move everything forward. Well, thank you um, for uh, both of your examples and for sitting with us here this morning for a, really a, uh, a conversation to launch us on these three days. And uh, as you can see by Chancellor Cantor's scarf, uh, it's homecoming weekend <laughs> at Syracuse University. And uh, Have a big guess here. <laughs> She has to uh, do many things today, I'm sure. Uh, she, she needs to uh, scoot. But uh, as many of you know, I'm from the Central Appalachian coal fields, uh, and uh, we often sing, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? And uh, these two people we've just been, uh, who've been talking with each other and with us have devoted their life to that hope that someday the circle will be unbroken. So we very much thank you. Sunday morning rode in a wagon Can't see lantern hanging on the side Walk behind the wagon Just to come around in To get ahead, you gotta learn to walk behind Chicky, chicky, boom, chicky, boom, chicky, boom, boom Chicky, 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 boom Chicky, boom, chicky, boom, boom Chicky, 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 boom Chicky, boom, chicky, 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 boom Chicky, chicky, boom, chicky, boom, chicky, boom, boom Chicky, chicky, chicky Worked in the mines before the union was organized like a pain. Dollar and a dime, 12 hours wages. Harder I worked, the more the boss made me. 